All right, thank you for bo to both of our um, uh, debaters. Now that the debate is over, we'll go back to Fox Studios uh, <laughs> for, uh, for, for our discussants to uh, break down the, uh, the debate. And so I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Laura Rodriguez for her first comments. You didn't, I, aha, aha, someone wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Um, so the, the people that I have for the, the, the discussants uh, are um, Mary and Howard and Laura. So you pulled this out of your I am not. I have, I have an email that talks about that the genomic medicine working group folks that, are not, that were not involved in the otherwise uh, will actually be uh, actually discussing. Did we tell discussing. them that? No. <laughs> they were on the email. <laughs> All right. So. Since there may have been a break in communication for which I am not going to take responsibility for, I will offer you the opportunity, but if you don't want to take it, then we'll open it up for open discussion. So. I'm actually happy to have it. Okay, go for it, Eric. I'm just trying to save the world. <laughs> so I, I, first of all, that was very entertaining. I thought it was very interesting. I, I, I guess the question, I mean, it is a bit of a false dichotomy. We should immediately appreciate it. It was theatrical. And that was the purpose, and that's fine. One of the things that strikes me, and I did like the analogy you were making with HIV, is you're arguing this as, as, as if it's a, a frozen point in time. But in, in reality, aren't we dealing with the circumstance that, that it's, it's the, the sands are shifting? And so trying to be too strident in a position is a little absurd because, or maybe not absurd, but it's, it, you're, you're arguing specific cases, but the, the, the base is changing, the, you know, the, the foundation is changing. And so if, if you try to argue too much in specifics, it'll be irrelevant at some period of time um, if you try to make generalizations. So, I mean, maybe, maybe the question's more for Gail in some ways, because she took a more, I mean, I think the, the lesson we heard first about HIV sort of illustrated the point that with time, more and more will go to primary care. You took a strident position almost as if, and again, to be theatrical, that wasn't going to be the case. But don't you admit that over time more will shift their way? And, the, and that they'll, but there, you may argue there'll be a residual that will always be in the hands of specialists? Or Yeah, I mean, if you look at the HIV example, the, those patients were only seen by specialists in the early days, right? And then as it became understood, as the information became more standardized, and frankly, as the population grew, then it moved into the primary care setting, and many of those patients still get referred to specialists depending on if they're not responding to usual treatment, et cetera. Um, so, you know, certainly right now, HIV has one test. We have 75,000. That's an obvious difference. Um, and, and who orders the right test is a big concern to me. But yeah, I absolutely think that, you know, as genetic information becomes more and more common in medical care, the primary care providers will have to and will pick it up and they will do more of it. Um, are they going to be ordering, you know, appropriate tests on appropriate people? In the future, I hope so. In the future, I hope so. And, and it seems to me that the, and the, other, the, the other component is that, which we almost can't totally get our heads around because we don't even know what the life's going to be. I mean, the, the whole data science, I mean, somebody, the numbers are just so out of control. At some point, it's going to be not the specialist to me, it's going to be the specialists who have developed the, the computational tools, the data science tools that the primary care physician will simply rely on for some of the things, whatever they read or whatever they quickly can find. Because, because even, the, even the specialists would do the same thing because they're going to be overwhelmed with the sheer volume of information. Sure. The question is, are those tools being developed? Are they out there? Do they know how to find them? For me, I prep, you know, almost an hour per patient for clinic, and I don't think most primary care providers are going to have the time to do that, right? And it, what is happening in the field is changing so fast, and frankly, which lab to send the test to and the financial implications of sending those tests and self-pay versus insurance pay, you know, those are very complicated um, parts of but, genetics. But the key to me is, do, do you honestly believe that it's going to be the same situation five years no, from now? No, of course not. Okay. Of so course it'll keep evolving. It'll yeah. keep evolving. So as it gets, as that part of it gets better for you, won't some of that then be more readily shiftable to a primary care physician? You'll still be stuck with the grungy stuff that has to be solved then and still be complicated. It'll be worse for you. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I, mean, I, I, mean, I think...
diagram. If they're, right, if, if not for a diagnostic component, that a lot of it should shift to actually genetic counselors. And so I think we should be tr honestly training up for that because in the long term, that's gonna be cost effective. The, you know, nurse practitioners are used extensively for many things. This is a very similar thing. You don't need a physician to do some of this care, and the genetic counselors may actually be better at it. So I actually th think that that model is going to be important. But genetics is hopefully going to be everywhere in every disease, and so every part of medicine will need to understand it. And I think Robert made a really good point earlier. Um, about this fractionalization, you know, there's information going to your, your OB and your pediatrician and your nephrologist and all these different specialties, but it's going to be in every part, and all of these people are going to have to learn it over time, and we're, the boundary of what requires a medical geneticist is going to move. I, I genuinely hope so, right? But it's going to move more slowly than we want it to, I think. Great. Howard. Oh, Carol. I just wanted to say quickly. Sorry. Um, I, I agree with my wise adversary <laughs> um, that, that it is a boundary issue. And like you're saying, Eric, the boundaries are going to change. So you, you've given me PGX. I will give you collagen and all the rare disorders. <laughs> We're done. We have a boundary. We have boundaries of certain people are going to stay mostly in your wheelhouse. Some are going to stay mostly in our wheelhouse. Um, and again, it's knowing who should go where. And, and I think as things get clear, it'll be easier for primary care providers to handle. The, the one thing I'm, I'm not positive about is where genetic counselors should fit in, and I'm not convinced that genetic counselors should fit into things like PGX and chronic disease testing, because I, I, I'm not sure, like I said, with our patients with chronic disease testing, they were a little grumbly about how much pre-testing information genetics counselors gave them. They felt like if the test is negative, I didn't need all that. If it's positive, I'll ask you if I want to, but if it's really like a creatinine, let me ask if I'm interested and don't bother me if I'm not. If you're just gonna change my drug or change a dose, let me ask the question. So I think in certain areas, they'll be more necessary in others. I, I think it's gonna fall more into a primary camp or specialty, non-genetic specialty camp. Howard. So, sad. Um, it was very upset. No, um, I, I think the, the uh, one thing that really came dot, up. Dot, dot, <laughs> dot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Confefe. Um, so uh, what, one of the things that, that really struck me from, from the, both presentations or both, both discussions was uh, we, genomic, genetic medicine needs to be as much medicine as genetic. And we have examples in, in the room here where there really is medicine practiced by a genetic trained physician. We have other examples, and won't name names well on, on, on live, but um, uh, where it's really more of a diagnostic visit and very little is conveyed on how to manage the patient. And I think that's what needs to be tightened up a bit is when the release happens, the, you know, the catch needs to be improved, that's weird, but when the release happens, that it's not just they have this bad thing when you literally could say it's sad, but, um, you, but rather, here's what you do. Um, and there's too little of that um, going on, at least in where I live, uh, in, in terms of actually helping a primary care physician manage that person internally. Uh, but, you know, they require that. And, you know, institutionally, we set up these special clinics because we think it's cool, it's good for marketing, it might make us some money, whatever. but really that handoff throughout all of medicine, not just genetics, is really getting harder and harder. And no one's really taking ownership of it. You know, as a specialty cancer center, we're not investing what we should in terms of making sure the hand back is um, truly a hand back or whether it's a, uh, a drop off and sprint away. Um, and so there's a lot for the field to do to make sure that there really is that sort of engagement two way or, or preferably uh, to go forward. I, I agree with you and I also think, I was just looking to see if David was here. He was saying in his study, that um, one of the um, one of the areas where patients, the one area where patients were most unhappy with genetic testing, was when they found out that there was no explanation for their child's illness that was genetic. So, so when genetic testing is done and it's a negative or an uncertain, it's sort of a negative unless we find something out later. Um, then we have really sad people coming back to us, and we and not only do we need one that's positive, but we also are going to need to do the what what's next. Mm -hmm. Great. So we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, before uh, I take the people who have their uh, cards uh, standing, I did want to just mention one thing uh, that I think uh, the genomic um, uh, 
um, uh, the NHGRI is, is working on that does address some of the issues, uh, which is how do we do this? Because I think a lot of times, and again, this was part of the artifice of the debate, was uh, we always think about things as physicians, you know. And so when I hear about pharmacogenomics, I think it shouldn't be primary care physicians, it should be genetic counselors, it shouldn't be geneticists, it should be pharmacists. Pharmacists do this every day. Uh, you know, I don't calculate zero order kinetics. I, my pharmacologists do that, I think. So it doesn't always have to default to physicians. And so there's a working group of ClinGen uh, called CADRE, the con uh, Consent and uh, Disclosure Recommendations, that actually has been doing uh, some formative research looking at how do we take different types of genetic information and convey that back. In some cases, it's really as simple as giving information sheets to patients. The information is so uh, banal, like for a negative test result, that you don't really have to see anybody, that it, it can be clearly uh, done that way. There are other situations where genetic counselors are more appropriate, others where medical geneticists, primary care. So they're working on a rubric by which we can begin to more rationally think about how we right size uh, who is actually involved in the process, which will hopefully uh, enable more scaling. And so I just wanted the group to be aware of uh, the funded efforts that are taking place in that space as well. So with that as uh, the uh, brief intro, I'll go uh, Heidi first. So Gail, this is one very specific question. A lot of the studies you showed, it was interesting to me that they never tested medical geneticists on all of these questions. <laughs> and you know, I've been involved in two lawsuits that were s supposed to sue the lab, and it turned out that it was actually the medical geneticists who made egregious errors. And you know, the number of medical geneticists might s think that hemochromatosis is a dominant disorder actually may be staggeringly high. You know, so you know, you are an exception, and there are a lot of exceptions in this room also. But I, I think it's there's a huge range and knowledge even amongst genetic colleagues, right? So that's one thing. The, the other thing, and not to say that there aren't plenty of situations where a geneticist actually has outstanding level of knowledge, but that's one thing that, well, exactly, everybody screws up, and I, it would be really, have been really interesting if they actually had included geneticists in those surveys. The other really critical thing, and this sort of speaks to some of the Howard's comments, but it can take you know, often at six months to get in to see a medical geneticist. And if we really want, in this evolving world of use of genetics, for those genetic, the genetic information to actually be dictating care and management and which tests are ordered and perhaps prevent ordering a lot of, you know, tests to save costs because you get the diagnosis immediately, we can't wait six months to get in to see the medical geneticist. So I think figuring out ways to improve the turnaround time is also going to be critical. So let me respond on the testing issue. We do take tests. They're called boards. And uh, we're required to keep taking them. And I'm taking tests I, every six months. I get a whole new set of questions that I have to answer correctly. And I'm sure there are other people in this room. Uh, so this is an ongoing evaluation process for people's capability to do medical genetics. That's not to say people don't make mistakes. They certainly do. Um, I think they do in all areas of medicine. But we actually are trained and credentialed to do this care and other specialties I, I'm not are not. With that. Just, you know, and I think the specialists need to are incorporating genetics into their curricula. So, you know, you look at the medical school curricula and genetics is only a two week thing. Well, actually, if you look at all the systems being addressed, every one of those systems should have genetics, cancer, cardiology, et cetera, incorporated into the training, and the physicians will actually learn better. It's in the context of specialties, right? And so, I think we just have to think about especially for non-syndromic conditions, you know, having specialists be able to contextualize that for cardiomyopathy or, you know, very, you know, kidney disorders or whatever, whereas the syndromes are where a geneticist really has a much better toolkit, I think, um, the complex disorders. Anyway, just thoughts. Yeah, I mean, as an adult geneticist, I'll say that, you know, I have not found that my colleagues, even the oncologists, even want to take over the genetic testing. Um, I have one colleague who, who, who does order t testing. Everyone else refers because they don't want to spend the time, energy, and deal with it, billing. or deal with billing. You know, honestly, there's reasons why people don't do it. I do agree every specialty should be better trained in genetics, but in, you know, until they are, 
um, then we have a gap. As far as wait list, we don't, we don't have a wait list to get into our clinic. If we have all your documentation, you can be seen within a couple weeks. I mean, it, you know, a couple weeks, we don't call a wait list. Um, the Children's Hospital does have a longer list. They're working hard to do that. We have emergency spots at both ends. Um, but you can wait, you know, I mean, I've waited that long to see a dermatologist. So, you know, I mean, waits in medicine is not unique to medical genetics. That's why we're called patients. Um, okay, I'm going to go with uh, Peter uh, next. I found this debate uh, really interesting because this is what, when I go out to the, my primary care sites for my educational tour, I call it, I see this debate play out for, you know, in, in real time with my clinicians. And so my role in my position is, well, how do I take these two different perspectives that are real perspectives in my institution and build a system that can handle that? Because I have some clinicians that no matter what we do right now, they're going to refer everything versus I do have champions who say, you know, I want to take this song. This is an exciting new era, era of medicine, but I want to be assured of that safety net. And I think that's part of, you know, the solution building is working on, well, how can we leverage things like in the EMR so that we can at least start to assess, well, who are our BRCA carriers in our system? Because that's a fundamentally difficult question for most hospital systems to answer and know that, okay, they're getting the right care. Um, sort of by admiring, well, what are they getting from their screening, et cetera, just like we do for other public health initiatives as, as well. And provide that reassurance that if someone is veering, whether it's a clinician, you know, uh, centric or just patient centric, fill in the gaps there. But part of that realization is, you know, getting sort of the, 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 the content, the educational content, the knowledge base that we're having to build de novo, and I imagine other institutions are struggling with this. So, as you know, NHGRI, how can we get more of that resource where it's more shareable into the EMR so not every institution has to build it? And the comment on the GCs with the pharmacogenomics, they don't get any training in, in, in drugs. So we actually started with our pharmacogenomics clinic model as a GC paired with a pharmacogenomicist, but then switched to an APN who we had some internal training to um, a model with um, our, our pharmacogenomicist. So, you know, this is how things have, you know, have evolved over time. Um, I, I hope that genomics can learn from other, other specialties that have gone before it. You know, there are, I have colleagues who refer hypertensives to cardiologists and people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, to endocrinologists. I don't. Um, and what happens over time is we try to figure out what system do we have to maximize appropriate and minimize inappropriate referrals, right? So now we have like, I don't know for sugar that we can call if we want a quick consult so we don't refer inappropriate people and we can curbside. And I assume genomics is going to go the same way for some of the simpler stuff. I still don't understand, even as a PCP, why I necessarily need a pharmacist if you're telling me that um, they shouldn't be on Plavix, they should be on something else, I'll, I'll, I'll just make the change. But, you know, but I think, you know, we, I, I hope, hopefully genomics can learn from all the other communities, but you're still trying to deal with appropriate referrals. So the comment on the pharmacogenomics, so we, our PCPs are ordering pharmacogenomics testing in our system, and our clinic is meant as that safety valve now where, you know, maybe there's, there's certain applications where we're not taking level one evidence from CPIC, but there are elements of the data where for a complex case, we, it takes, you know, kind of that level of expertise where we have had some successful anecdotal intervention, but providing that safety net. Great. So I have uh, Terry and Steven, and then Bruce, and Dick, and Robert, and Bob, that's the, and Jeff. Uh, that's, uh, that's the order I have. That'll, um, may do us, uh, but we'll see how things go. So Terry? So, so I wanted to get back to the issue of handoffs, and perhaps Steven is going to respond on this, but, but perhaps he'll respond when I call him, um, which, which is that my, my understanding, Steven, is that you do a fair amount of handoff to the, to the neonatologist, but there is a certain degree of, of a given specialty feeling like they know how to manage an area, and they don't want some, a specialist telling them, do this, do that, just give me the information, and I'll work with it. So maybe you could comment on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the spirit with which you presented this and for you teeing it up. Uh, I think that what we find is a festering wound in modern medicine um, that is all too real and for which patients routinely suffer. Uh, turf wars between subspecialists are ubiquitous. <laughs> um, I don't actually think there is much of a turf war at all between primary care physicians and medical geneticists but I do think there is between 
uh, subspecialists, and particularly in tertiary and quaternary care, and these wars can be bitter, and patients suffer day in, day out because of egos and lines drawn in the sand, and whether you regard this as your domain, and hell, you're not coming in that door. Uh, and it's tragic, and we forget that we are servants, um, not glorious physicians. So I, I appreciate the, the tenor of this and the light-hearted manner, but I think there is, there is an ugly truth uh, beneath this. Uh, people have made really good times. I mean, um, I, I love my medical genetics colleagues. I love David Dimmock to death. I couldn't consider how we might um, pioneer in genomic medicine as an institute without having somebody like him to be our heart, our beating heart, in everything that we do. But the fact of life is there's only a couple of hundred folk like David Dimmock who practice in the United States. There are entire states that have not a single medical geneticist. There are large regions of very populous, I mean, right now, we're looking at putting our technology into Arizona. There's one practicing uh, medical geneticist in that state. Can you rem believe that? Um, he's retired, so he works part-time. Um, they cannot attract another medical geneticist because that person will be on call 24-7, 365 days a year, and will cover both dysmorphology and biochemical. Uh, every positive newborn screen. Um, so, you know, there are extraordinary things. Patients wait on average in tertiary care and quaternary care for six months to see a medical geneticist. Clearly, we need solutions. Uh, part of this has to fall on the shoulders of, of the, um, the, the specialty bodies. Um, something which I think makes eminent sense is to say what is a minimum curriculum whereby um, uh, good medical geneticists would say, I accept that you have a proficiency, a level of skill that I'm comfortable with. You're not going to make the stupid rookie mistakes. You're going to get it right most of the time, and we're going to teach you when you need to hand off you know, a certificate of competency that could be accomplished by really any pediatric specialist in, say, three months um, based on case-based learning. I think that's what we desperately need, because like it or not, uh, genomes are going to become ubiquitous in healthcare, whether we like it or not. Um, it's going to happen if we're not very careful, as with other major recent transformations in healthcare delivery, where the entire um, medical establishment misses the boat entirely and it becomes a direct to consumer play. Um, that's my fear. It's not whether it's primary care physicians who are interpreting the results or, or medical geneticists. It's much more that um, 23andMe will be the provider of healthcare excellence uh, and other organizations like it. Um, I also think for medical geneticists, the world is radically changing. Their world is, is and, and I feel for them, is no longer about making a diagnosis. We now know that a good genome with a reasonable history taken by a non-expert will make a, a genetic disease diagnosis um, it, it really routinely. Um, and so their world is now changing to be much more about, so therefore what? What can we do to change the trajectory in this patient? And thankfully we have a new arsenal of drugs and interventions that really give hope that we can change the whole specialty from being a descriptive specialty to one which is therapeutic in emphasis. And this resonates with me. I trained as a rheumatologist back when we also were the guys called in to put a label on a disease that we could not treat. Well, we could. We gave everybody steroids. And if those didn't work, we gave them cyclophosphamide. <laughs> um, so I, I really feel for them. And now I look at my old specialty, and they're so interventionist uh, in their approach, and the field has changed remarkably. So sorry for taking so long. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, go to Bruce because uh, there's been a couple of comments about curriculum, and I know that that's something you spent a tremendous amount of time on, so it seems appropriate to let you uh, talk about that and also ask your question. So I actually hadn't planned to say anything about that, but since you ask, 
Um, I just want to, let me just make three quick points and then I'll come to that. Um, I agree with Eric that it was a false dichotomy to begin with. Um, genomic medicine isn't one thing. It covers a broad territory and I think we, the two of you would agree that there's room for both, um, for lots of different um, practitioners. I was going to say the same thing Stephen just did, so I won't other than endorse it. I, I sort of hate to hear that we just diagnose and then release. I really do think geneticists have to take responsibility for management and treatment of the kind of rare complex disorders that we become, I think, somewhat uniquely familiar with. The third thing I was going to point out, which I don't think has been said before, is that somehow there seems to be an underlying assumption that all this has to be done by human beings. And I'm not so sure that's necessarily true. I think there should be room for artificial intelligence and other kinds of um, novel approaches, for example, to pretest counseling. Um, what would be so bad about pediatricians sending genome sequencing on their uh, patients who have some sort of developmental disability or, or um, congenital anomalies? When I think of the diagnoses that we do make by sequencing, I'm humbled by the fact that almost never is the answer something I had thought of a priori. And I think we do a pretty good job of explaining it after the fact, but I have to admit that usually we're at the end of a long line of people who didn't think of it, and then the genome reveals it. So what would be so bad? Well, one thing that would be so bad is they might not do such a great job or even take the time to do the kind of pretest counseling you wish would happen. And maybe genetic counselors can fill that void, but maybe there are other innovative ways we could think of to do it, realizing that scaling the workforce is, is a challenge. Um, finally, to um, Mark's point about curriculum, I've spent a lot of my time over the years trying to help educate people, medical students, genetic counseling students, and many others about the kind of fundamental vocabulary of genetics and genomics, things like, you know, what does a variant of unknown significance mean? It means it's a variant whose significance is unknown, something that you would have thought wouldn't be so hard, but. <laughs> and no, I absolutely agree that we need to focus on that. But on the other hand, when I think about the kind of things I do in practice, I order a lot of MRIs. If you were to trap me and say, how does MRI work? I couldn't begin, and I'll, I'll hypothesize that most of my radiology colleagues couldn't either. And because you don't have to. I mean, you have to if you want to develop new approaches to it. You need to be able to understand the physics for that, but not to order it and to interpret it. There are people who are really good at recognizing the patterns and, you know, looking over your shoulder and helping you, but I feel pretty comfortable doing those things. So I absolutely agree that we need to educate, but I, I actually, frankly, think sometimes we expect too much in the education system, and rather I would like to see us do a better job of developing systems. When people make mistakes in interpreting results, how much of it is on them and how much of it is on the way the report was written and designed that made it easy for them to misinterpret it? And yeah, an expert won't make that mistake, but would it be better if the lab did a better job of writing the report clearly so that even a non-expert wouldn't make that mistake? So I think there's plenty of room for improved education, but I also think there's a lot of room for improved systems. Thank you. Uh, Dick. I just want to quickly ask, um, based on what you were just saying and maybe ask Gail, um, is it, would it be appropriate in some situations like what you were saying, if there are times that you think like, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the time the test would be negative, would there be times where a more primary care person or a non-genetic medicine person could order the test? with some prep and then only refer the positives. You know, it used to be that we sent everybody with diabetes for retinal exams to the ophthalmologist. Now we have retinal cameras, we only send the positives to the ophthalmologist. So is there a way that the, the general community could absorb some of the testing and send you the positives or is the pre-testing so important that we can't do it? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, you know, I think there are probably areas where that, can, that you know, standardized tests, if, if lots of people are going to get the same test and you know what test it is, you know, I think that sending an array on a child with, you know, intellectual disability as a first test is something primary care providers do, 
and it's a good first place, and if it comes back positive, they often refer, and if it comes back negative, then they refer for the next thing. So I think there are individual tests. The question, and I think you can explain the limitations of the test, and frankly, I think for a raise, you know, it's, it's not that challenging. Um, and the parents are very motivated, <laughs> so they'll probably sign up. Um, you know, I think it is harder to know what is the test to send in many circumstances, and you know, panel testing is helping with that a little, but not entirely. Um, and so, you know, I think though that's really the challenging. If, if if there's a straightforward, obvious test, or if we get to the point where we're doing like cardiac risk scores, um, you know, those may be appropriate things that primary care providers can can order and frankly explain even. Um, but I think a lot there there's going to be a lot of subtlety in the just the scope of the field is very wide. Yeah, I think it's important. Um, uh, you know, I agree that I think we could develop uh, guidelines uh, for a lot of scenarios that could uh, facilitate uh, ordering. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that there's another educational component that comes in here that we frequently don't acknowledge, and that is um, uh, our friends that are actually are developing the tests and the panels that are coming in and talking to the docs. And frequently the competitive argument is, well, our panel tests for 50 genes, whereas our, our competitors only test for 30 genes. Well, we only understand 10 genes, so I really only want those 10. I don't, because I know that what happens to the variance of uncertain significance, the more we do. So, you know, we have to have some sort of a way to um, uh, make sure that uh, we can take in information like the Brugada information and just say, you've got 30 genes on a Brugada panel, you, d you need one gene. That, that's all we have the evidence for right now. Uh, but that's, of course, not the way we have tended to, to compete uh, around that. But I think that there are ways to develop systems that would essentially be able to, um, to do that in a more automated uh, way. And that's been done in other uh, situations, certain um, rheumatologic uh, tests, um, uh, where there'll be a, a, uh, you know, an order set that essentially says, if this, then this, then, and you can do that kind of decision support in a reasonable way. So that's what we've tried to accomplish with our genetic model assessment tools. If we know if there's certain affirmative actions, we're going to start with a certain panel that has, you know, NCCN guidelines, genes, et cetera. So there's certain areas where we can start with that. And then if it's negative, or then we can, you know, kind of reflex if we need a broader panel or, or, you know, that can be seen. But I would argue that, you know, as a geneticist, I, I don't need to see as the first line, the, the breast cancer patient who's a vascularizing Jewish ancestry. There's a starting point there that we can definitely build a system around. Dick. So first of all, there may be some lessons to be learned, even though Gail wants to give it away from pharmacogenomics, in, in that this is the aspect of clinical genomics that is already touching virtually every patient everywhere in terms of large academic medical centers. And what we've learned at the Mayo Clinic, where for many years now, there have been alerts. The doctor doesn't order the test. There's an alert that says, if you order this drug, there's enough clinical evidence that you want to consider ordering a test. If it's TPMT, I hope they order it, but, uh, or DPYD. But uh, the fact of the matter is that's all reactive, and what we've now done with 10,000 of our local patients who get their care from primary care physicians is to preemptively sequence all the known clinically uh, actionable pharmacogenes and put that information in their electronic health record. Now remember, the doctor didn't order that. Even with our, our prompting, the reactive, the physician has to order the test. Now, it's all going in their electronic health record, and these are virtually entirely primary care physicians, so we're running the, the, the test and seeing uh, what the results are. And it's fascinating to see the, the sort of outcome. Some, some of these primary care physicians, within a matter of a few months, will find 200 of their patients will have sequence-based information on all the pharmacogenes in the electronic health record much of it dealing with drugs the patients are already on. And some of it says, that may not be the best drug for this patient, and think about how we handle that. Now, when we did that, immediately, and began even moving where we're moving, we have 700 pharmacists on our Rochester campus. When the, the time came for them to respond, because what did the doctors do when that alert came up? They picked up the phone and called the pharmacist. They didn't pick up the phone and call me, thank you, God. They picked up the phone and called the pharmacist. And the pharmacist of my age range, 
would know an intron from an exon, from an enhancer, from a promoter, from a splice variant. And they just wanted this to go away. The younger pharmacists saw this as a career path. And so now we have young pharmacists who are wrapping their arms around this. Many of them trained with Mary and some of them trained at Florida, you know who, who, who's doing this sort of thing. They're, they're PGY2 pharmacogenomics trained uh, uh, PharmDs. And we're hiring those people, lots of them, not for the routine stuff. Because what happens in both the specialties and in primary care is the same. Some enthusiastic young physician who doesn't know that they're not supposed to deal in something they don't know anything about becomes the champion. And they teach the people of my generation what, what really needs to be done, except in the complex cases. Then the PharmDs are called in. So it's evolving in a way that both of, you know, both of you were right, of course. I mean, we all understand that. But we're running the experiments now. That's a microcosm, even though you want to give it away. That's a microcosm of what I think we, we heard Eric saying just a few minutes ago. This has all evolved very rapidly, shockingly to me, how rapidly these bright young people, both from the pharmacy and from the medical side, both in primary care settings and in specialty settings, the dynamics, the social dynamics are the same in both of them. And I think this is what's going to happen broadly in genomics. It's just one example of it. So uh, like most debates, you were both right. Robert. Sure, keep it brief. I just think following up on Dick's point, uh, what, what he's saying about pharmacogenomics we found in the MedSeq project, which specifically looked at primary care docs who self-identified as being interested in this. And I think there's gonna be whole new cadres of primary care docs who self-select. And if we can match that up with clear reporting and a safety net, uh, like we did in, Med in, in, in MedSeq for primary care docs in an academic setting, sure they're in an academic setting, we're also doing it in MilSeq for primary care providers, not even all doctors, in a military setting, and we're transcribing what they say to their patients and reading these and identifying errors and finding that with just three to six hours of orientation to that report, they make precious few errors, certainly no <coughs> errors that we would consider egregious. So I do think, I mean, I, I sympathize with the kind of um, anecdotes that Gail is, is reporting, and I'm sure that they're gonna continue to happen to some extent. But I do think with some forward-looking thinking over time, and we're gonna find people who self-select and lead this field. Secondly, I think we, we have to realize that there's an inevitability to the integration of genomics and that we have this responsibility to create ways to manage it, not just with decision support, but with allowing other specialties in primary care to do this. If we hold, if we try to build some artificial wall, we're inviting a whole different initiatives from consumerist point of view to reject us, the medical world, the academic world, that as, as somehow too slow moving to meet their needs. And there, I think there's a real danger at a sort of pseudo-scientific consumer backlash that, that sort of paints us as unwilling to move quickly enough uh, while, for, for these exact reasons, in part because we're, we're, we're sort of protecting the excellent from the good enough. So um, this is just, by the way, a, a preview of things to come because it's gonna get worse when we get into multi-omics, when we get into integrating, uh, if we're talking mostly about sequencing today, when we get into integrating multi-omics, microbiomics, metabolomics, where there's even less of an identified database, I think this gets worse and we've finally got to be able to train ourselves to be comfortable saying we don't know. So those are, those are some thoughts from Mitzi. I always thought that was the most important thing for a geneticist to learn, was 50 different ways to say I don't know, but still be supportive in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, so and, and for that reason, I do, I do really recognize how Carol emphasized mm -hmm. that in her side of the debate, though I agree they weren't actually totally opposed to each other. But she, she emphasized the responsibility to talk about the limits of our knowledge which is key. Good, Bob. Um, just to uh, get back to the false dichotomy and point out that it's in part driven by our healthcare reimbursement system where uh, you get a one choice. You get to do it yourself or you get to refer to someone else and either one, one way or the other somebody's gonna bill for it. 
um, and that I think as we move towards accountable care organizations and others that don't work under the same principles, um, there are opportunities for a, 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 a much more a graded um, approach to um, utilizing the expertise of the medical geneticist. Uh, as you know, in doing curbside consults and doing um, uh, consultations through the EHR that are recorded and maintained as part of the part of the record, um, but where the geneticist doesn't see the actual patient necessarily, if that's not needed to answer the question, the, the hole that the primary care provider has in their knowledge. So we have uh, one more question. Um, but before I give Terry the last word, because I picked on Gail, but, but we know really who always has a last word. Um, uh, I just wanted to come back to something that Bruce has said in an earlier session. Uh, he said in a, in, in a different way, I think more looking at data visualization and the cool tools and everything. But you mentioned the term system engineering. And I think that really a lot of what we're talking about here, um, you know, really comes down to how do we actually think about uh, practicing medicine in, in a systematic way uh, as opposed to the traditional way that we've uh, always done it, um, which is very physician focused. I, I think, you know, um, high performing healthcare uh, systems have identified the fact that in, in many cases, if not most cases, uh, care that is not provided by the physician actually gives better results. Um, if you have diabetic nurse educators, you get better results. If you use pharmacists to run chronic disease clinics for medication management, you get better results. Um, and it's just a matter of having uh, physicians do what they're really good at, which is uh, actually synthesizing data in, in, in unknowns and not having them do the routine sort of stuff. And so I think there's a lot of what genomic medicine is going to evolve to, uh, to Eric's point, that is going to become more routine, in, in which case we can build systems around it to really help to uh, keep things uh, organized. And so my sense is that everything is on the table in terms of, uh, of the discussion. We, we need everybody at the table and we need everybody participating, uh, which will be um, exciting uh, and scary, which change always is. So with that, uh, Terry, you get the last word. Uh, well, I, I would like to, to raise the issue that Stephen raised in terms of certificates of, of competency. So, so Bruce, not to not to call on you, except I'm calling on you. Um, I, I can recall a discussion among the Association of Professors of Human and Molecular Medical Genetics where where this idea came up, and and this was several years ago. And the feeling was it would take an awful lot of effort to develop such a curriculum, and there wouldn't be enough people to use it. I, I mean, that's how I recall the conversation. You may want to comment differently, but but things have changed since then so that NHS England has produced a very nice curriculum that is available to anyone and, and they are essentially upskilling their primary care practitioners to be able to do this kind of work. And probably the demand is increasing and it almost likely will, will increase dramatically in the next few years. So, so I guess the question is to, to those of you who are, you know, died in the world geneticists, is, is this such a crazy idea and is it something that we could possibly try to implement? You're referring to creating curricula that um, would a three-month curriculum for for your you know for your dumb internists like me to to be able to say yeah I can handle probably half of the sort of routine complex disease pharmacogenetic sorts of sorts of topics uh, without killing anybody uh, and and know when to refer somebody I mean I think that's Stephen what you were what you were sort of suggesting is that right. Yeah, so, well, you mentioned APHMG. They have developed curricula, actually, or at least um, fairly detailed lists of competencies that are intended mostly to inform medical school. I don't think they've extended out into um, continuing medical education, for example. Um, I don't think it's at all a crazy idea. I think the, the challenge has always been one of um, you know, the sort of marketplace, I guess you could call it, which is if, if they build it, is anybody actually going to come and use it? And so it's always been a bit of a, a question about um, creating something and putting a lot of time and effort into it and then worrying that now who would actually come to take these courses or to participate in these curricula. Um, so I think that's been one of the bigger challenges is just a concern about um, sustainability of that sort of thing. but. You know, the idea of um, infiltrating into the educational systems of different specialties and seeding them with not overwhelming amounts, but relevant amounts of material in the long run is probably a, a really important opportunity. And it's one that 
in my judgment, the genetics community has been slow to adopt, maybe because you know, they're not welcome into some of these other places. It's hard to be sure. Um, you know, there is a little bit of a turf protection um, phenomenon probably taking place. But no, I don't think it's at all unrealistic, particularly if there were incentives put in the path to um, make it really worth their while. I think it's really more of a Google map problem. I think what we have not figured out how to do is to teach people how to read the map. You know, because we don't have street level information in our heads, but we've learned how to read a map, or in some cases listen to a voice, wisely or not, um, that tells us where to go. And, you know, I'm a pretty much a nihilist when it comes to traditional medical education because I think the evidence tends to show that uh, our traditional way of delivering content through lectures or certifications or that really doesn't impact because if you could imagine a scenario where you would do your three months, you're all ready to go, and if it's a year before you see your first relevant patient, it's all gone. And so I think what we really need to say is how do we do this on the fly? And we've had some experience now in our program with uh, you know, some of our primary care physicians, about 20% of them that really want to take ownership of returning that result. And so we've built for them very short, you know, directive, sort of like the ACMG Act Sheets, where it says, okay, if it's this result, this is what it means, this is what you do, uh, and here's the number to call if you have any additional questions. It's very directive, it's very clear, it's one page, uh, and it's accompanied with patient materials that they can hand off. They're getting very good at that, and they like it. They enjoy being able to do that, and the point that Carol was making earlier, they have the relationship with that patient, which is when I come in, I have to try and build that up, and I don't know all the other contextual factors. So I think that type of point of care, just in time, with somebody that has at least a basic competence about how to you know, read the map, is ultimately where we're going to end up going, and, and over time, that's going to build a competent workforce. So I can't so resist but to point out the time I went two hours out of my way because it turned out when I put a thing into the GPS, it turned out to be two small towns that sounded close enough alike, and I didn't think that why am I going north when I should be going east? It, it's, the, the Google Maps has, as an analogy, is, is certainly not perfect, and, and, and we've all been... By the way, it had a medical outcome, which is I finally arrived at my destination hours late. No place was open. I went to a pub for dinner and got food poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just come... Yeah, let, let me just comment, Mark, that, that I, I wouldn't expect your average um, uh, primary care physician to, to get this certificate and then sit in their office and wait for a, a genetic -y patient to come to them. I mean, what, what I was thinking was more on, on the realm of a consult service, which I think a couple of people have mentioned. So, so what if, if that person then became the consultant for their hospital when, when a genomic case came up? Um, that, you know, that might be a way of, of sort of addressing both of those needs. Yeah, so we've had a, a couple of... Um, ABN's now as part of the City of Hope inherited cancer virtual program as an extender because it's pretty intensive actually when I got under the hood of it, but they completed it and so they're helping us bridge some of the demand that we have because while well, we're still trying to hire genetic counselors, it's still taking time to, to fill in that, that void. So this is an alternative. Um, you know, I could see this concept because I we have a our cardiomyopathy director, you know, he, we've had numerous conversations, so we've built a, um, a systematic relationship where, you know, he starts by, because nine times out of 10, the patient's affected when he comes in, so it's a very different conversation. So we have this balance of, well, we, we have a structured way of ordering, so we, we can know where the result is so that we can help with the follow-up. So if there's a positive or a VUS, he then kicks it to the genetics clinic to help, but whether it's you know getting under the wheels of well, why is it a VUS or help initiating that cascade testing, et cetera. So, you know, if there's some level that clinicians like him that are physician champions in our in our system could be you know could, could be demonstrated, I think there's a, a real potential there. Great. So, are you closing the session or am I? Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like to thank Mark for being such an excellent moderator. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Um, and, and sorry that we went a few minutes over, but I think it was worth it. Um, we'll reconvene tomorrow morning at 8.30. There will be breakfast out here starting at 8 o'clock, 7, 7.30. So get here early. All right. See you, see you tomorrow. <laughs> early. Or it'll all be gone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if it were graduate students, it would be all gone.